Thank you. Hi, everyone. So first of all, why would I talk about something that sounds like uh, some kind of self-help book? <laughs> well, we first of all need that. And uh, I was always quite a quirky, uh, a bit strange personality when I started quality analysis career. I loved what I do, and I was pretty authentic all the time. However, around a year ago, I faced some kind of authenticity problem. So uh, I forgot who I was, and I had to regain power in my situation and what I was doing. I needed to get some kind of reset. And today, when I look back at this, I managed to recover from that and regain my power. However, not much changed when it comes to external factors. So what changed the most was my mindset. So today I'd like to share my story with you, what journey I had, what kind of change I had, as well as what kind of issues there were and what kind of learnings I had. So to begin with, what is authenticity? So authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen, said Brené Brown. And Brené Brown has a lot of great books and resources. Um, for example, Empathy versus Sympathy. And um, when she once gave a talk in a conference, the other day she felt extremely vulnerable. I think it felt it like lasted for maybe a week even. And I feel that being authentic the choice to be real, to just show up and be honest, that's scary. That's really scary. And that actually opens up for vulnerabilities. And well, when it comes to my journey, I actually very often ask myself, why on earth did I get myself here? Nobody else made me do this. I did it to myself. And this is what I did with my career. So I had very steep leaps in the career choices I made. And I love challenges, but I feel that all these challenges make me grow and learn more and more about myself, others, as well as my career. So I started in the very usual setting. So I was a siloed QA, or better to say, a manual tester, uh, testing after development, right? So development is done, and then we do manual testing. And I worked in this big multinational company, and I gained great testing fundamentals. I'm still grateful for that. I learned about exploratory testing, about test plans, and so on. However, I really loved collaborating with others, and I couldn't, because testers were more like a tribe there. They were all together and not really wanting to work with developers, for example. And I felt, you know, I'm ready for a new challenge, because I love challenges. So. I'm originally Lithuanian. Lithuania is a tiny country close to the Baltic Sea in Europe, northern slash eastern. <laughs> and um, I was living there. And then after being uh, in Sweden for a year for study exchange, I was like, well, I'd love to move and explore the world because it's, it's, it's full of adventure. And then almost by accident, I found a job ad, uh, which was in a country I have never even visited before. And, but it sounded great. So I was like, why not? So eventually, after actually interview process, I ended up moving to Hungary, a country that speaks completely different language, different culture. Um, and I moved to Budapest, not knowing anyone there or even visiting the country before. When I landed, it was already for the job. And the first person I met in Hungary was my boss. And I joined the the fashion startup. How exciting, right? So it's a new domain, and I was first ever quality analyst they ever had. So as a result, I had lots of work to do and learn and grow myself. And there were no balls because I was the only QA there. So what I did was I had quite a great journey, and I actually learned automation finally. And uh, I used, of course, Selenium, Jenkins. And Java was an interesting one for me because I never coded a lot before. Uh, so as a result, when I created my first project, I was so excited. Yes, it's working. You know, I'm asserting these things. I have automated checks. 
and uh, there was no one else to review my code except for the senior Java developer who had 10 years of experience. I was like, all right, that's, that's fine. <laughs> and I was like, it works, I mean, I'm happy. Uh, and I got around 50 comments for my first pull request because it all was wrong. All the conventions were wrong, code was not clean at all. And first I was rather frustrated with that. However, with time I realized I learned so much from this. Of course I felt like a noob and I felt like a kindergarten kid going to, I don't know, a university. However, it was a big growth opportunity and I managed to somehow overcome this. And with time, I started collaborating with so much more roles in the company, from developers, of course, to salespeople, or even CEO. And what I did a lot was that I found a big passion, which is monitoring and numbers, data. And I started looking at production um, data. And the thing is that we worked with fashion retailers. So we had lots of very interesting uh, data to analyze. And I could finally actually lift up myself from just a tester, I could say, to a quality analyst because I was looking at impact, let's say, of issues I found. What actually matters? I was invited to quality, uh, to give quality insights in my weekly priority meetings with CEO and the head of engineering. And I loved what I did. Because it was so fascinating sometimes to take a look at, okay, um, in some city, something doesn't work. So there was lots of observability and learning. And I started this shift to a quality analyst, I would say, that it became not just testing, it's way, way more. And I worked with so many more people and I started learning a lot going to conferences as well as, for example, there are modern testing principles by Alan Page. And it sounds amazing that we improve quality as, as, as a team and that new modern testers are doing uh, more coaching rather than maybe testing. And we went, um, well, I went to a conference to speak to Ireland. Oops, and I shifted my journey very fast now. Um, <laughs> so I went to speak uh, in a conference in Ireland and actually I got a terrible cold and I was just sitting in the corner and munching on honey um, and the organizer lady likely was thinking, oh, this poor girl, you know, maybe she has a talk next day and she's just alone in the corner. And she introduced me to someone uh, from ThoughtWorks. And I was like, hmm, you know, of course I've heard the name. And we started talking about QA and what does it mean? That so many times it's about solving people's problems. It's not just testing, it's so much more. It's making people talk to each other because they don't manage to, to do that. And um, I was like, okay. And they are working actually in these modern um, QA ways. So I was like, wow, that sounds great. So, you know, as I am, as crazy as I am, I just decided to move to Germany on my own yet again. Um, <laughs> I never lived there before. Um, I didn't even like it as much, but I was like, well, work sounds interesting. So I moved there for work. And an interesting thing is, okay, so I shift to this more modern quality analyst but they also shift to consulting, which is a new thing for me. And I really like this quote by Jerry Weinberg saying that the better adapted you are, the less adaptable you tend to be. And I think this is what consulting in the end is. If we are working in a big company and a big or small, but we are working there for a long time, we get integrated. We reach our comfort zone. As a result, we are adapted, but change is way more difficult for us. As a consultant, you shift projects, so then change is inevitable. Change is a part of your career, which can be very hard mentally, actually, because you may not feel integrated sometimes, and you're always made to be adaptable. So how does uh, ThoughtWorks do QA? So in previous talk, we thought, how should it be done? Well, there are some teams who are trying to do this. So in ThoughtWorks, uh, QA starts as early as possible, even maybe from design mocks. It could be from prototypes. And we, first of all, uh, pair up with business analysts and we write stories together and we try to build the right product. We question this. We work as well with user experience designers, not only business designers. And then we actually try to uh, have way shorter cycle time. So we do not have a separate QA column very often. 
what we do is that we try to build it right by pairing with developers, having certain practices like TDD, helping them to think of test cases. And, and this is way shorter than the usual cycle, but it's a very challenging one. And then, of course, there's feedback cycles, so what happens later on? And when you think about this, you're like, okay, so what does, so QA does requirement analysis, QA does development, um, so what do we actually do? So there is this graph in ThoughtWorks, which was not created by a QA, just for the, for the uh, information, because it looks like QA is the center of the universe. Um, and uh, it actually is sort of like that. And I think that's why I like QA from the start, because I like talking to different professionals. I like getting to know how they do things. And of course, testing is the main expertise that we have. However, we have to know a lot from other domains and other role work. So I get assigned to your first project. I'm excited. I get to work as this modern QA. Um, but just one thing happens that in ThoughtWorks, we go alone. And you are going as a solo role to a cross-functional team to work as a QA, and you are expected to be this modern QA, and I'm like, yay, I'm excited. I'll learn on this. And um, then I'm like, okay, so how do I help a development? I'm like, maybe we, we can TDD something. And they're like, there's nothing to TDD. There's just infrastructure code at the moment. I'm like, ooh, okay, <laughs> infrastructure code, ooh. I never worked with that, but uh, that's fine. Um, and then it's a super high-performing team, uh, meaning that they are the developers that we fear of. They are developers who could win the battle and say why they are testing everything, and they have it there. So they are very confident, very vocal people um, who had testing strategy in place, and it's, it looked beautiful. I was like, okay, well, what do I do then? Um, well, there are user stories, right, so requirements. And they were written by another consultancy, a different team, which is not really a part of our uh, team. So then I would be like, well, I'm not going to go and tell them how to do their work, right? So I am in this dilemma, and I've never worked in this context, and I'm excited to learn more things. So, but I felt so different. I was the one QA, and then there were six developers, so usual developers are in pairs, and I was alone. And I was expected to be this modern QA who can help from the very, very start. And at this very start, it is infrastructure state. And I'm looking at the team, they're looking at me, we're like, we're not sure what to do here, but uh, let's try to make it, of course. Um, and we started even thinking, okay, we can pair. So I can pair with the developer and we can actually work on infrastructure together. And that's great, and I learned a lot, and I was extremely, extremely happy However, it's overwhelming trying to be someone else because when pairing, I would compare myself with the developer who's an infrastructure expert, and I'd be like, I'm a silent pair. I'm not saying much. I can help sometimes to try to figure out something or point out a little thing, but I did not feel like I'm contributing. So all these um, previous jobs, and I'm not doing something that I already did before, and I feel like I'm just there, and maybe I'm not really doing enough. And I started reading a lot, and I started expanding horizons in the sense that I would try to understand all the testing concepts that, for example, in automation and in healthy test pyramid, like contract tests, so I could help the developers, right? So when we, they are doing that, that I would have ability, because if I don't know, of course I cannot do that. And I started reading some of the very great books, which helped a lot, but they are also on high level. So what we learn the most is from practical real life experiences. And then I was like, wow, I do not know what to do in this situation. So I asked for advice. And advice I got was, be bold. And I hated it. I was like, I just moved to a new country. I don't know anyone here. I am supposed to be this modern, some kind of quality analyst, and, and a person tells me, be bold. I don't feel bold at all. I feel fragile. I feel like I don't know what to do in this situation. And, and then some kind of dark times hit me. 
I would go to work and I would uh, survive my day and I would learn and try to be strong. And then I would go back home and sometimes I would see people going to the supermarket and I'd be like, wow, you're thinking what you get for dinner. And I'm thinking, what did I do with my life? Why did I move? Why did I in general took this job? And maybe, maybe tech is not for me because I'm not good enough. Maybe hiring did a mistake to hire me. Maybe I'm just a fraud. And it was a very, very hard period in my life. And uh, it's, it's the whole other topic, uh, what happens when there's burnout and how do you come, come out of that? And it took a lot of time to recover. But I realized that I a little bit maybe forgot who I was. And one thing that, however cheesy it is, that helped was talking to others. And again, I moved so much. Um, so it's hard, but the thing is that in a group, usually people do not say that they are facing the same thing. And you don't want to open up in a group either. It's scary. However, if you talk to someone one-on-one, one -on -one, very often people are facing similar issues with you. And they also feel that maybe they are not good enough. And you can relate and get actual advice. And getting this feedback, uh, understanding what the team actually wants from you. Um, I started talking one-on-one -on -one with other team members and saying, hey, you know, what do you expect from my role? What is quality to you? And they started saying, yeah, I, I, I do not think that you should think that you should be infrastructure expert. And it calmed me down a little bit. It was step by step, lots of conversations, lots of uh, opening up, which is very hard and vulnerable. And then once I met another QA, which is a rather rare occasion um, in a big consultancy, and they told me something, she was, you got this, there is a reason why you're here, that you are with a certain authentic skill set for a reason. You are here to help the team. And yes, you are different, and you stand out from this team a lot, but you are there because they want you to be there. And as simple as it sounds, it actually helped me a lot. That yes, I'm there being myself, being my authentic me. Um, but then the question is, who am I? I forgot who I was at that point. And uh, this is actually an allegorical painting for know thyself phrase. And, uh, and that's what I, I just stopped for a minute. And I was like, all right. So, um, so I had to actually recharge and regain my power. So what are my strengths? I do know some things, right? I'm not like I don't know anything. <laughs> so I had to remind myself that there are things that I know and there are things that I don't, and that's okay. And I have to learn somehow to grow myself and maybe improve. And I started actually thinking, okay, so what differentiates me that others may value in the team? And yes, I am different and it's hard for me to compare myself with someone else. And I started actually first thing for regaining power. I just created this wall of post-its, writing out what do I think are the pain points and bottlenecks that the team is facing. My desk is a mess because it's full of post-its and all kinds of ideas how I could help. And actually I realized that even in that infrastructure setup, it was not that perfect. There were many things that could be improved, but I had somehow to just stop uh, believing everyone and be like, okay, maybe there are things that I could help to improve. Not just think, yeah, they are doing a great job and you just go on. And the first thing, of course, that we talk about is this quality advocating. So even if it is a high performing developers team, we are the ones who can drive a lot of quality conversations. They may think about testing. A lot of times I work with developers who think about testing a lot and they mention it and they're like, yes, you should include performance testing, but still having a person to try to advocate quality a lot helps a lot. And this is as well with alignment between the teams or even team members. Someone may say unit test, another one can say integration test. They clash and they think that it's one and the same thing. Um, so you as a, as a quality analyst can really help in these situations. And this is a shift. So it's a shift from just getting a task to test to something that, okay, we have to promote this quality mindset. And finally, my business card, I just realized on, in the workshop that my business card for QA is question asker. And 
I feel that it is one of the biggest superpowers that we may have. And uh, as in the previous talk, we have to ask questions and from the very start. And a lot of times I have drawn uh, diagrams of the architecture design. And I would be like, okay, so explain to me, so how do we test this part? Or how are we covering that? And the requirements as well. What about the negative cases? What if this doesn't go right? And these questions are extremely, extremely valuable for the team. And another thing, of course, with testing expertise we can do is bug bashes or just process improvements. How is something being done and run within the team? Just visualizing how we are working can help a lot. And I just realizing that I have this power allowed me, okay, I'm, I'm a bit more powerful. I am useful um, sometimes. And then I realized that, okay, what else differentiates me? I have extreme attention to detail, sometimes too much, and I realize a lot of you as well, because in some talks you're like, oh, there's a typo there. That's what I have as well. It's a professional illness. And when I go shopping, I also cannot buy not a perfect item. I look at the item for like 10 minutes and I try to find a, a better one. Um, and this attention to detail, actually what I found, can be actually very useful even in infrastructure um, developing. Because in infrastructure developing, very often, I don't know, maybe the developers I worked with, but they can be very clumsy. And they make typos, and then they have to rerun the comments many times. And a lot of them really appreciate if you're like, hey, there's a typo before we run, maybe you could fix this. They're like, yeah, you're right, exactly, there is a typo. Or just asking a question, how did we do this? And some of the people are extremely happy to explain this and they realize certain problems that they left. And you learn a lot and they learn a lot and it can be very beneficial pairing. Another thing is product focus. Of course, working as a QA, I had a lot of business domain knowledge and the product focus. And even in that situation, in the first project, I realized that, yes, yeah, stories were a big pain point. And yes, they were written, written by another team, but how could I help? So we actually started having meetings, talking about their requirements and how we can improve them. And it helped the team enormously. And I am a people's person. And when I first joined, I was rather shy and I didn't want to speak up. But I am the person who, in my previous company, when I said that I left, the one developer almost fell and he was like, oh no, we will go bankrupt. Uh, because I think I ended up being team glue, which is a rather invisible work, but it holds the team and people come to you and they can talk to you. And uh, empathy for me is one of the main things that I think we should all have more empathy for each other. And I realized that even increasing the team mood um, is something that I love doing and it helps. It helps the quality of work if I do that and uh, helping with team ceremonies. So finally, actually, once we had a retrospective and one developer said, you know what I like this sprint? That Lena was singing randomly. And I was like, what? I was singing randomly. And apparently one day a lot of song references came to my head and I started humming and they loved it. <laughs> they were like, wow. Um, and when it comes to team ceremonies, it's also a shift, right, to the team approach. Uh, so we created a story kickoff list. So we have certain uh, ceremonies planned with our team and story kickoff list is when we have a story ready for development and we actually want to align all of us. And usually it's a QA, developers, as well as some people from product side. And we go through this list and we ask questions, as many as we want. And number four is how will it be tested? And we discuss, okay, what levels will we take? Will we include the end-to-end test? Will we do exploratory testing? Uh, how will we actually show this feature that is working? And this helped the team so much. A lot of people came after this uh, list was implemented and they're like, wow, Lena, thank you for introducing this. It really helps us. And they use it even if I am not present in the sprint, for example. They can still uh, kick off stories and align. Oh, sorry. Um, so another love that I have, so I said that I love monitoring, I love logging, I love alerts. And working in a very high performing team, sometimes I think, oh, everyone knows it. No, everyone knows it. So then what can I contribute with if everyone is so good at it? And once we had a production issue, 
And we were debugging it and trying to understand the root cause of that. And I was pairing with a very experienced developer who was a tech lead in our team. And I was like, oh, yay, this is very interesting. We're getting to the root cause, and we're collecting this data from the logs. And my prayer was the extreme opposite. He was like, oh, I'm so frustrated. I hate looking at logs. I don't like it at all. And I realized that you know, all of us have certain passions. And my passion for monitoring logs and alerts not necessarily is everyone else's passion as well. And now I really help the team with that. because. A lot of people see it as a tedious task that they don't want to do, and they even get stressed looking at that. And of course, we have to make our work fun and embrace talent and interest. Especially, I think it's very useful in testing. If we need to use some kind of data, it can help find very interesting bugs. So for me, I found some very interesting bugs, just let's say learning Swedish. Um, and I would use certain words, and then they would result in different results than ABC or random text. Um, one of the developers in my team actually loves emojis. And he puts it everywhere. So he puts it in unit tests. He puts it in input fields. Um, and I know that it will be tested. I know that encoding issues will be found just because this developer actually includes emojis, and we, we will support this. So when I look back, so these little things help me to find my own value in this different context. And change is extremely scary. So especially leaping through this modern QA and helping high-performing team, which may happen. But I think what's scarier here is vulnerability that comes with that. That comes with, I am me, and I am this and I have to be more proactive, and I have to be more critical, and it's different, the work I do. Um, so it is quite scary. Um, but how do we actually increase this power? How can we do this um, to feel more powerful in just being authentic? So one of the quotes that I really like, that actually someone told me from work, was you have to get weak in order to get strong. And I feel that this is a lot about all the insecurities we have. So we have two ways. We can either just put it all under the carpet and forget, OK, I, I cannot do this. So then I just forget about it, and I move on, and I'm um, moving on with what I have. Or you can get it out and work on it, which is something that can make you way stronger. And um, an example I like to give is Singer Pink. Uh, she does air gymnastics in her performances. And once there was an interviewer who asked, hey, you know, aren't you afraid of heights? And you do this amazing work. And she said, oh, I'm terrified of heights. That is why I do it, actually. And they were like, what? Yeah, and she, she actually does it just to overcome the fear. And she lived with, she was like, I could not live with such a big fear that I had. So I had somehow to work on it. And it does not mean that the fear went away. And she says she's still scared, but less scared. And I think very often about authenticity that some people say, oh, it's just being who you are. Um, no, not really. It's actually about, yes, finding power in your strengths, but most importantly, working on improvements for you, working on improving your weaknesses. That is authenticity. That is feeling more powerful and embracing yourself and the way you uh, live in general or work. And how do you do that? Well, experiments. It's scary. It's also a change. But as in one of the talks we heard, you have to try sometimes instead of changing. Um, so Carol Dweck in her growth mindset book said that you try something, it doesn't work, and maybe people even criticize you. In a fixed mindset, you say, I tried this, it's over. In a growth mindset, you look for what you've learned. All right, so we tried it. It did not work, and that's fine, and we move on. Uh, and that actually happens with teams as well, because maybe certain thing may not work for the team, especially if it's a high-performing team. It's not that you will have always a QA column or review column or testing column. You may need to change ways of working. So I think that modern quality leaders go, and I say quality leaders because I feel we all have to transition to quality leaders. 
is to enable the team to build high quality products. And this may mean that we are changing the ways we work a lot. It can be a lot of change, it's a lot of vulnerability, it's a lot of fear and scary things. So I really like this graphic talking about leaders versus bosses, saying that a leader doesn't care what caused the mess, they jump right in to help clean it up, while a boss doesn't help, blames everyone else for the mess and dresses up like Napoleon. <laughs> uh, so I feel like as modern quality leaders, we definitely have to help enable the team and help them how to fix it instead of building silos and saying, hey, I don't know, so I don't ask me. No, it'll be okay. I will try to help you with whatever I have and let's learn together. And all this experience I had, I knew Agile Manifesto, but I think I didn't get it. So I had to have some pain in order to actually understand Agile Manifesto better, especially these two points, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, and responding to change over following a plan. That's exactly where I feel our role is moving towards, that it may not be always processes and tools. We may need to work in different ways to help the team to think what is quality for everyone if we work together, as well as there may be no plans um, on, let's say, I worked with this tool and now I will work with it for the rest of my life. No, we may need to respond to change. And when it comes to authenticity, I feel like one thing that's very important is supporting everyone else as well. Because there is power in diversity of authenticity. Uh, we need, we talked about uh, tester teams, that we need to understand humans as well. And um, we may not represent all humanity, of course. So having a very diverse uh, teams helps us to be better in the work we do. And in my team, we are seven uh, people, a cross-functional team, and we are all different nationalities. We come with our uh, luggage from, of culture, of a lot of misunderstandings that we have between each other even. And we learn a lot and we grow together with this. And I thought, all right, so this is the talk about authenticity and this is my journey. Um, but how do I actually end in a most authentic way? And I wrote a poem <laughs> because that's what I do. And there may be times when you say to yourself, I'm not good enough. Why do I even try? It may continue day after day, even in the middle of the night, wondering how everyone has their careers going so fine. But everyone is not you. And that's okay. You fear to be different, but knowing thyself is the only way to learn, improve, and even help each other grow to train the growth mindset and reach the goal. And hey you, if something is hard to do, do it more often. And remember, you are good enough and you can even get better if you accept yourself and others for who you are, embrace your inner strength and keep an open heart. Thank you.